Okay, well, we're going to go on to our next speaker now, which is who is Claudia. She's from the UK. She's wor has worked full time as an artist potter since 1988. She's known for making big pots that record women's histories and support campaigns against men's violence towards women and girls, especially in the sex trade. She is the subversive author of uh, sorry, the author of Subversive <laughs> Ceramics, Bloomsbury 2016. And uh, thank you so much for coming on, Claudia. And over to you. OK, so we'll just go straight into the next slide so you get a picture to look at. Uh, this pot is called Ararat to Albania. It's huge, by the way. That's about 85 centimetres high, which is nearly a metre. It's big. Um, try to imagine it big. There are pictures coming up of me with the pot, so you'll get some idea of, of sort of scale. Right, okay, so um, what I'm going to do is, um, there's going to be an introduction where I'll just talk a bit about my actual practice as an artist, as a potter, um, and then I'm going to talk about the difficulties I have of showing the work, um, and then I'll go, sort of run through the numbers of times that I've faced either classic censorship in the old school sense of the word with um, work being removed from shows or hidden or um, sort of, but, but the classic example of what censorship normally is. And then um, it moves on to, mark, to the, the feminist version, which is being disinvited, also known as deplatforming or canceled, um, which is um, basically if you have a kind of binding contract with an organization and then uh, something kicks off, something blows off and you get removed at the last minute and it's ghastly. Um, so, and, and then I'm going to end up with an analysis. My basic, in a sentence, thesis for all this is that actually a pre-existing environment of censorship and restriction um, and sort of anxiety in the British art world has really fostered, um, it, you know, it, it, it has really enabled the attack on feminist artists, on female artists, on lesbian art, and um, and uh, you know, it, you I mean, you will sort of dissect misogyny as part of that right the way through. It's a it's a thread that runs through it from beginning to end, but but it it, it that pre existing censorship is actually part of it. Um, so I make pots. So I've got something to paint on. I actually trained as a painter originally. And I moved over to pots because um, I, I love narrative. And the thing about a pot is it turns around. So you've got this opportunity for a kind of narrative to unfold across the surface. You can also see in this one, it gives you this opportunity. There's quite dizzying perspectives that you can get from that shape of the pot, from the, the concave and convex shape. Um, now this one records um, a part of the, it's my kind of memorial pop to, pop to the First World War, and it records this kind of interesting corner of women's history I didn't know about, which was this, the um, founding of the Scottish Women's Hospitals in 1915. These were field hospitals. So it features Elsie Maud Inglis, who's Ingalls, who's the founder of that movement, um, and also Mabel Stowe, Sinclair Stowe Bart, and um, Major Flora Sands, these are really extraordinary women who did very remarkable things during the First World War. They're amazing stories, and I do recommend that you kind of pursue um, them. And it, it also gave me a chance to talk actually about the Armenian genocide, which is a, a little bit easily forgotten, I think, and also um, the Great Serbian Retreat, about which I knew nothing. Um, so there, there was there's plenty going on. In, in that single pot, but it, it was the women's history that I was really after. Our history goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So pot has ways of sort of doing politics and doing political art. What they're not good at is the urgent response. So all those kind of wonderful graphic artists and designers who can you know, turn something around in sometimes a couple of hours and produce memes and t-shirts and marvelous things like they do, um, we're not so great at that. But what parts are brilliant at is memorializing and remembering. And what you will find you go into any museums, they're stacked full of pots, usually in the upper floor, the sort of mad woman in the attic that's been forgotten, covered in dust, you know, this sort of thing. Um, you will find yet more forgotten corners of history there. Um, so they're kind of, I, I was kind of interested to take that and try and turn it round and, and use it for recording kind of women's 
contemporary histories, women's accounts and stories now, and as a way of responding to women experiences. So this is this part that you're looking at now um, is there's this three views of I'm not the criminal, um, which is a part of a project I've done with Women at the Well. Women at the Well is a service based in, it's a women only service. It's based in King's Cross in London. It provides support to women in prostitution and it also helps them to find ways out. They asked me to work with them to produce a collection of pots that um, illustrates the accounts of the women that they support and work with. Um, so this is um, I'm Not the Criminal, which kind of records, it's, it's an abolitionist campaign um, that they run, that women in the world also run. And I am an abolitionist feminist. That is, I um, obviously deplore the sex trade and I call, I uh, campaign an advocate for the complete abolition of the sex trade. Um, and so this, this piece that you're looking at, it, it's depicted on the outside in a very satirical sort of grotesque mode. Uh, the sort of, are the grotesques of the men that use the sex trade that pay for sex and abuse women and girls. On the inside, sort of brightly lit and bursting their way out of this very oppressive system, which is the sex trade, um, is our, our survivors of the sex trade, this particular individual, Fiona Broadfoot, who is really instrumental in bringing some very important legal reforms. Um, and what you will also see is this pot is broken and mended. And that is another thing that really drew me to ceramics. Materially, as well as being this ancient craft with its, its capacity to, to record histories, it's, it can be broken, it can mended. And I found it to be a compelling metaphor for trauma and survival that people, you often hear women say, I was shattered and now I'm piecing myself slowly back together. And that sense of kind of mending the pot, it, 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 what it did was it helped me to show the, the violence, the real viciousness that's present in sexual violence and in the sex trade, but without actually having to reproduce it pictorially, which I really didn't want to have to do. And um, so it, it kind of shows the violence, but equally it shows the survival, the restoration, the mending, the sisterhood, the companionability of putting something back together again. This piece is called Shattered, um, uh, completed in two, it took me four years to do, completed in 2007. And I'm gonna move, um, one of the pieces in this is called Princess Hymen. And it's the one at the far end on the left of the screen. So, I mean, these are vast, these are two meter high pots. I haven't made anything this height since. The, pre, the, the Ararat to Albania, the first pot you looked at is about half the height. And the one directly before, I'm not the criminal, about a third. So, but I mean, they're still quite big pots, even those. Um, so again, you see the shattered and rebuilt um, method approach this. Princess Hyman, um, basically it, it's, it's a kind of meditation, if you like, on, on the whole concept of the virgin body and, the, and how that only affects women. In that piece, I, I also reflect, it's sort of virginity, the virgin body, FGM, virginity testing, the whole culture of virginity. And um, I listened to a great many women's stories in order to help me make this. Um, and they were mostly women actually who lived lo locally, but then through them, I actually met a number of women in Iran. Um, my connection with Iran is more complicated to explain. I do have some family in Iran actually. Um, but um, that's a long story, which I won't go into now. Um, but so, but so there is quite a, it ended up being with a slightly stronger tilt towards the sort of Iranian story. So that's why Princess Hyman and this thing about this kind of testable virginity, testing for the virtue of, of the girl, of the woman um, and, and what all that means. Now I had huge difficulties showing this piece. Um, it was shown in 2009 and 2010. Um, there was questions raised around it in 2009. Um, I was able to bring in a feminist to help me sort that out. And, um, and then, but in 2010, it really encountered problems. And Inish Princess Hyman was actually removed from the show initially. I fought back, I managed to get it reinstated 
by various means. I managed to get the local press and the local vicar on side. The local vicar was an absolute champion. And, um, but her, above all, I got it re reinstated um, and, and the concession was that they would show only one side of it, um, which is the side where you can see with me standing next to it. And, um, and then, the other side was hidden, but hurrah for the great British public, because they were then deluged with complaints by the public who said that they could only see half the work, they couldn't see it properly. Um, so I ended up getting compensation for this, although I might add that the people didn't, they didn't actually sort out the way it was displayed so that people could see it. The reason given for that cancellation was because of the, the obvious vagina imagery. Well, there is no vagina image on that pot at all. I subsequently found out that actually what was being complained about was, was that, there, I mean, there weren't even any complaints, but what they were worried about was that the local Muslim population might be upset by it in some way because they were worried that I'd been critical of FGM, which is, is in words down the side. I'm afraid you can't see it on this slide. Sorry about that. Um, but there is some text down the side where I actually address more of those issues. And, um, um, but what was so interesting was that they wanted to keep that bit quiet. And that there's a kind of, that's part of this kind of running thread that you'll hear more about. I'll talk more about that. Um, and about how they always seem to hide their fears and then trot out something else to cover it up. Um, what I also found out was then there was no consultation with any of the Muslim populations. And actually, you know, it, this was actually something of a fantasy. This is 2016. And after that debacle at, in 2010, I resolved not to show in public sector spaces anymore because I found they were so censorious and they seemed to be particularly oppressive towards any issues related to women, any feminist work. This one is actually an homage to Charlie Hebdo. This was, um, this is, um, the text actually is blasphemous, possibly. It's a debatable point actually, and I'm not a religious scholar, so I'm not gonna presume too far on that. It, it was done sort of in, to commemorate the, 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 the massacre of the Charlie Hebdo team and a number, I mean, 17 peoples were murdered by, you know, armed jihadists in Paris on that, day and I made a piece in, to commemorate that event because I mean these were artists that were murdered as well as um you know a police concierge and four Jews who were shopping and um murdered because they were Jews I would like to add and um but this was removed from the show completely and hidden right away so that there was an empty showcase and um the reason I was given was that it was because I'd showed the face of the prophet. Um, now that is a major blunder on, all, on a million different levels. Firstly, there is no prohibition on blasphemy in UK law. Secondly, it's a sectarian move. Manchester, and this was in the um, People's History Museum, Manchester has a large Shia population. It is not prohibited to depict the prophet in Shia Islam anyway. Um, and even in Sunni Islam, it's the veneration that is prohibited, not the imagery itself. So it's all much more complicated than that. Um, so this was again, it was, they refer to it, you know, sensor, community sensitivities. Actually it's not, what's running through this is a specter of the great big hairy scary Muslim who might well explode. And the sort of fear of a kind of possible Muslim anger that might be there, which are, you know, it, bluntly it is actually racism this but it's being paraded as anti-racism and as community sensitivities coupled with it is ignorance and fear and and just anxiety and now you know curators can't know everything but where they're not sure they need to ask and at the very least come back and talk to the artist it is possible that the artist knows what she's doing um you know and where they don't do what the very first woman did when questions were raised in 2009 over Princess Hyman. She went and talked to a feminist diversities officer in Haringey who advised her 
properly that there was nothing wrong with that work and that it should be shown. So there is even an example of good practice. This piece is called <coughs> February Dark and Cold. Um, this is uh, again part of and the door open the project I'm doing with women at the well. This was to be shown in 2019. Um, at, at, and the, the venue is called Crossbone Cemetery, and there was an event to, scheduled to go with it as well. And this was an event that was agreed with the Arts Council, legally binding contract. And um, the reason given was some cock and bull story about the, the, that um, some of their volunteers had decided I was too commercial, and that because I showed in a gallery in Mayfair, and all that that entailed, was a direct quote from the email that um, I therefore should not be permitted to show at um, Crossbone Cemetery. And, you know, because perish the thought, I sell my work because yes, you, you know, I have to pay the studio rent funnily enough. And, um, but actually the reason which I already knew about and I also got some back channel confirmation from a very reliable source is that sex workers rights activists who, by the way, were all PhD students, they had decided that the work was not sex positive enough and they were sex positive. And that this work being an abolitionist piece was too negative. And that, you know, everything about the cemetery where they volunteered was meant to be a healing space and my work was not healing and that it was blah 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 too negative whereas actually of course they just hate abolitionists that's what this this is a pimp lobby we know that so it was vetoed and then i mean literally a month later or i mean a very short time later we went into lock covid and lockdown and so it was very difficult to discern really what the repercussions of all this were other than the fact that I got cancelled and that you know it was difficult for the whole project so this piece is called Brave Face um this is also part of and the door opened this was going to be displayed at Central St Martin School of Art in London um at Ceramic Art London which is a major weekend art fair event um, which is organized by the Craft Potters Association of which I am a member and with whom I have worked for decades. And they are in many ways the nearest thing I have to a union. I was going to do a lecture about the project with women at the well. And I was, so I was, yeah, I was going to be talking about pots and accounts of women um, in prostitution and, um, it was going to be, you know, how I, how I make the work and how it, how I work with those women to kind of express the stories that, that they are telling. And I mean, you might remember from the first one I showed, I'm not the criminal. That was very much, that was quite a triumphant piece um, with the, the very positive images on the inside and she's breaking out and fighting her own oppression and, and the sort of, the, the, the grotesque ghouls of the sex trade are sort of falling to bits on the outside. The second one, February Dark and Cold, that's a much more kind of nuanced piece. There, she was very much, you know, going through the process. If you want to go back to the slide before, please do, that's, that's fine. Um, and, but, but she's, um, you know, there, her, her, it, it's very much in the present. So some of what she's trying to forget is locked inside the pot and you can partially see it. This one, Brave Face, it considers the lives of women who might enter the sex trade a bit later in life. And, um, you know, I've listened to a great many women tell me that they entered the sex trade in their 20s, frequently in order to pay off a debt. And they thought they could do so easily. And of course, found that it was actually much harder to get out once they were in it. Um, so this is really about the brave face that every woman I have ever encountered who has survived the sex trade or who is still caught up within it has to put on to go and meet her client or her pimp or indeed just to leave the house, to go shopping, you know, to cope with life. It's that brave face. And it is um, on the inside, there are images of these exact same women. And it, I'm thinking about disassociation. 
and that sense of the fragmented self. Now this is, was going to be shown, as I said, at Ceramic Art London, organized by the Craft Potters Association, and to be shown in the, the fair takes place in Central St. Martins. This was the same thing. I was disinvited at the last minute, legally binding contract, trashed, thrown to the four winds. And um, I was, um, you know, um, told after much struggle, what they, they refused to, what I was told initially was that they had been informed that there would be a protest that would shut down the show or at minimum delay it. And therefore they couldn't risk showing me in my work. Um, after much pushing, they then said, well, yes, it was because of your, that was because of your gender critical ideas. So take note, nothing to do with what I was going to show or what I was going to say, but what I think, which is the Orwellian version of all this. And, you know, no, again, no consultation with me. Nobody made the effort to find out what I think. They just decided they knew. And then um, um, I, I've taken legal action. So this, this is now in process. So be a little bit careful with what I say. What we now know, though, is that there was no threat of a protest at all. The entire thing was made up by the organiser at Central St Martins who was scared there might be a protest, which is a completely different thing. So Kathleen Stock once said, not very long ago, that she felt that it wasn't so much the students were the problem that were the lecturers. I have to say, my experience really bears that out. And that this is, um, in this case, certainly, this made me into a target because all this year then I've had these problems so that I was invited just to go and attend a degree show at Cardiff University. They, I was then disinvited, I then heard that there may be problems because somebody thought that my presence in the building would be incendiary. That was overruled thankfully because a very fierce student went to see the Dean and complained loudly and kicked up a bus. Hurrah for her. And then um, I was invited to give a talk at Tate Modern. And then um, that was, I was okay, but the woman organizing that faced serious problems from, from Tate. That led to real repercussions. So that's an example of the knock on that it's not just, not only I am the target, but people who work with me become the target. Um, and then the most recent one was a place in Hampstead, which um, I was going to show in. I was going to show the women at the well work again. And then, a lot, you know, I was sent the contract to sign. I looked very carefully at the record of the museum as a whole. I detected there would be problems. I didn't trust them to stand up for me if now knowing that I was a target, that, that there were attacks, as I was sure there would be, and sure enough, they disinvited me. And um, so again, it, it's, it's, I'm now gonna move on to the analysis side of that. So my kind of, again, and, and that wasn't the curator, the curator was keen for me, to, very, very keen to show the work, it was the boss who, actually wanted to keep his little coterie nice and secure and not have me showing feminist, sex trade abolitionist work, but they trotted out the gender critical thing again because none of them seemed to notice the full starter judgment or have read the Rheindorf review. So, I mean, in principle, that could have gone to court as well, but I only got band weights for one major issue at the moment. And, um, and so on we go. Um, so that's where I am right now. Um, now, this is what it, 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 it's, I think I, I, I sort of demonstrated that, that there was this pre-existing anxiety, which was, I feel kind of fueled by a sort of anxiety, a kind of racism around Muslim audiences and how they might react to certain kinds of work. Um, a real failure to, a, a real ignorance and fear about the issues related to that anyway, and a failure to, to really find out about them having had, having been alerted to them. And then um, 
moving on to my most recent cancellations, although the reason given is certainly an attack on, on gender critical um, feminism, it, I can't ignore the fact that every time that has been brought out, it's been in response to work which is about sex trade abolition. And what um, is also true of the art world is to date, there has never been an exhibition, to my knowledge anyway, which showcases those values that are really critical of the sex trade from a properly feminist perspective that advocates sex trade abolition. The only um, politics that they will countenance is full decriminalization. The kind of, if you like, it, it's sometimes referred to as liberal. I, I, there's nothing liberal about it in my view, but the pimp lobby that, the, the, you know, the, the pro-pimp, um, the, 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 the basic pimp and, and punter decriminalization uh, view of it. That's the only view that they will countenance. It's a big recent show recently at the ICA in London. There have been numerous others and there has never been a show that um, actually showcases the kind of ideas that I'm, I'm displaying and in my work. Um, apart from now, actually, and, and at Gallery 2 Exits in London, I, I went to see a, a gallery that showcased my work, in the, that, that exhibited my work in the past. And the man who runs it doesn't do, doesn't actually do many exhibitions this year. When I told him what had happened and I said, look, you might well get a demonstration outside your door or have problems. And he said, well, let the blue heads do their worst. I don't care, bring it on. I'm gonna show the work, I can't stand this sort of thing. And he's, he wouldn't even consider himself a feminist. This is a, a commitment to the right for expression that is doing that. But that's a genuine commitment, not the faux commitment that you will often find that a gallery will um, enunciate while not actually following through. Oh, look, we've just, we've just seen this final slide with Leanne. Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to say next slide, please. Oh, yes, that yeah, yeah, that's great. the slide that raised the hornet's nest at the Tate. It was, oh, there was right. no such thing as a woman with a penis. Oh, and, fantastic. And that is what caused the hullabaloo and why the, the organiser then faced repercussions as well as me. Yes. It's taken me many years to engage the interest of feminists. Um, it's a very recent thing that I've really succeeded in doing that, um, which I, I have strongly said, I think it's part of my generation, that there was a lot of suspicion about, femini about art. And I think it's in large part, it's because my generation's feminism came from the left. And the left has always been a little bit iffy about art and perceived it as a bit of a bourgeois thing. Um, oh, yeah. But also, I think it's it, it's partly slogan art is fine, but once you remove the slogans and you start going to send something a bit more complicated and it, it requires a little bit more attention. But the other problem is getting shown. So getting feminist work shown in galleries is really difficult. So it's actually incredibly difficult for feminists to reach me and for me to reach feminists.